Welcome back everybody to our studies in the law of trusts. We're coming towards the end of our lessons on the subject of trusts, specifically looking at the duties and the powers of trustees. And this lesson is going to focus on the idea known as the self-dealing rule. We'll explain what the self-dealing rule fundamentally is. And then what we'll do is we will uh, provide some case law that just illustrates what the self-dealing rule actually looks like in operation and how it actually works. Just like with a lot of different concepts that we've done when we've looked at various different areas of the law, we've generally gone about explaining the concept first and then looking at some nice case law that illustrates how that uh, how that how the case, uh, how the the principle works itself. So this basically requires us to spend a little bit more time and in a little bit more detail examining the nature of the fiduciary relationship between the trustee and the beneficiary under a trust instrument. Remember, a fiduciary responsibility, a fiduciary relationship is just simply a relationship of trust and confidence between, uh, between individuals. So, for example, a solicitor and a client, a doctor and a patient, they are said to be relationships of trust and confidence and so therefore are considered to be fiduciary. The idea of the self-dealing rule, therefore, is essentially designed to protect the interests of a particular beneficiary uh, over and above that of the commercial interests of a trustee. So given that there is a trustee that has a fiduciary relationship with a beneficiary, and given the fact that uh, that means that there are therefore duties and obligations that a trustee has towards the beneficiary, uh, the self-dealing rule essentially protects the beneficiary's interests over the commercial interests of a trustee. And what the rule essentially tells us is that where there is the sale of some trust property by a trustee, this sale is voidable by the beneficiary. Okay. So... In order to properly understand this, you obviously have to have a basic understanding of how and what voidability means in and around the law of contracts. So for those of you who haven't studied contracts, voidability refers to essentially the option on the part of one of the parties to render an agreement void. So void is essentially where the agreement never existed in the first place. Voidability is where one of the parties who may have been wronged, who may have suffered some kind of uh, or been the victim of some kind of breach of contract, they have the ability to decide uh, and have the option to decide whether or not they want to render that contract void. And so what the self-dealing rule essentially does in utilizing the concept of voidability is suggest here that where there is the sale of a trust property by a trustee, even if that trust property is done so for the uh, purposes of benefiting a beneficiary, the sale of that property can be made voidable by the beneficiary. The beneficiary can say, no, this sale is rendered void. I don't want this sale to, be, to, to, to go ahead. And in doing so, what this essentially does is it provides an extra set of protection against uh, the idea of a, of a, of a trustee uh, essentially being able to, uh, a trustee essentially being able to utilize uh, property and to have and to put ahead of uh, the fiduciary relationship with the beneficiary their commercial um, interests. So noted here, obviously, remembering back to studies in contracts, what this essentially does is it ensures that the fiduciary relationship between the trustee and the beneficiary cannot be overruled by the commercial interests of the trustee. That's fundamentally the beginnings and endings of the self-dealing rule. So that's what the rule is. How exactly is this rule then applied? Well, owing to the nature and the duties of the trustee, under the relationship that we have, this is a rule which is strictly enforced by the courts, okay? So it is often irrelevant, for example, if there had been a good faith transaction or if the trustee has retired in any meaningful sense. But it does seem to be the case, however, that if a trustee has been retired or is sort of out of the picture for a long enough period of, uh, of time, this may see them uh, being released from the obligations of the rule. Uh, and we can see some illustrations of some of these ideas and the enforcement of this rule through the courts by looking at the 1968 case of Holder and Holder. 
This was a case in which the trustee had sought to renounce their obligations under the trust instrument as a trustee. So essentially, they didn't want to be a trustee anymore and they sought to renounce their obligations as being one. But this was not effective owing to the fact that he had performed some trustee related tasks. So he had done some things that essentially had made him part of the trust relationship. He had done things that were related to his obligations as a trustee. So the renouncement of those obligations became a little bit more difficult. After a certain amount of time, two other administrators of the property, two other trustees, had placed the property in question on sale at auction. Okay, so there is the ability here, they are selling trust property. And so the self-dealing rules suggest here that the beneficiary um, uh, has the ability to, uh, or at least enforceable through the courts, there is the ability for that, this sale uh, and auction to be rendered void. The person who was originally a trustee had gone to purchase this property for a fair price, but was blocked by these other administrators on the basis that they were in fact a, um, uh, they had in fact a fiduciary duty under the trust, and so could not place his own interests ahead of this relationship and this obligation. So seemingly what seems to have happened, at least on its face, is that a trustee um, has been given the obligations under the trust instrument, performed a few of those obligations, and then sought to renounce themselves under the trust instrument, at which point the other um, administrators of the property went on to, sale, uh, to sell this property at auction, at which point this original trustee sought to try and purchase that uh, property um, themselves. The courts, however, held that this was in fact an acceptable purchase. And you might be wondering why. Well, this was owing to two major reasons. There were two factors which led to this being considered a valid purchase. First, they had paid a fair price for the property. It wasn't like they were trying to fundamentally swindle the beneficiary out of the trust property by giving them less than the property was worth. And so the fact that there was a fair price automatically, or at least instinctively, according to at least in the eyes of the course, instinctively um, uh, provided a certain degree of legitimacy to this sale. In addition to this, they were also the ones, uh, sorry, they were not the ones who had authorised the sale of the property in the first place. So not only had they not authorised the sale of the property in the first place, they had renounced themselves or sought to renounce themselves as, um, as, as a trustee and therefore their obligations under the trust instrument. And so in doing so, um, and they in doing so, it wasn't them who authorized the sale of the property in the first place. The sale of the property was a subsidiary uh, factor that ultimately this individual seems to have uh, uh, taken advantage of, leapt, leapt upon the idea of the sale of the property. You go, oh, I want that property. And then also went about um, purchasing that property for a fair price. In addition to the self-dealing rule, there is this idea known as the fair dealing rule. And essentially, if a trustee seeks to purchase an equitable interest in the property, which is being held on trust for a beneficiary, this may be done if they act honestly and for a fair price with the full disclosure to the beneficiaries of what has taken place. This is known as the fair dealing rule and essentially softens some of the sharp edges of the self-dealing rule that that that, that might um that, you know that, that that might give a certain degree of, of flexibility to the trustees in these circumstances if these obligations however are not adhered to then just like with the self-dealing rule there would be the application of that rule fundamentally it will render the transaction voidable on the part of the beneficiary <laughs>